Well, good evening and welcome educators to Belong Be Becomes monthly Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We're lucky to have uh, Sandy Wong here this evening, who is a professor in early childhood at Macquarie University. Uh, Sandy conducts collaborative research with academics, early childhood organisations and practitioners and governments on early childhood practices, workforce issues and educator wellbeing. Her current project being the Early Childhood Educator Wellbeing Project, which is what we are going to discuss tonight. So welcome, Sandy, and thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Alana. <laughs> um, I thought that just to start, you Ooh, might like to elaborate. There's that fly. There's that fly again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're Sorry, I've got this massive fly, fly in my room. Let me see. If I, <laughs> I hope there's no vegans because I'm just going to... There we go. That won't bother us for a little while. <laughs> All right, let's start again. <laughs> Welcome, Sandy. Um, I thought that just, just before we get stuck right into the, um, the, the project, that maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about yourself and um, what, I guess, prompted or inspired you to start um, researching educator wellbeing. Oh, thanks, Alana. Um, so in the olden days, I used to be a nurse before I um, became an educator, an early childhood educator. And I, then I had my own children and did family daycare and got really involved in, um, interested in children's development and how they learn and grow and decided I'd have a switching career and move to early childhood education. Um, I got my degree, so I'm a, I am a qualified early childhood teacher, although I've never worked in the field as a teacher. Um, I've just, uh, I got the research bug and stayed on and did research and uh, did my PhD. And then from, after doing my PhD, I, I went and worked with an early childhood organization a not-for-profit organization, because I felt a bit of a fraud and thought that I really do need to get into the profession and see what's going on. And it was during that time that I really became aware um, of the stresses and strains on educators. Um, the, I, I kind of always knew the complexity of the work, but it was it dawned on me just how challenging the work is and how um, difficult it is. And I, my respect for the field went up and I became started to become very concerned about educators. Um, it's, you know, particularly... We want to improve the lives of all children, with just, you know, particularly those from vulnerable and disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, but I was working with educators who have very many children with very many challenging behaviours. And I then got concerned around, well, who's looking after the educators? Who's enabling the educators to do this work? And um, I was joined by Tamara Cumming, who is my co-lead on the Wellbeing Project. And we started to kind of think about, well, what can we what can we do? How can we investigate early childhood educator wellbeing? And really, in I went back to academia, and in academia, you can't do anything when you um, until you can build up a track record and you get some research under your belt and get some funding to help you. And eventually, I got into a position where I had built my reputation and doing lots of research on other people's projects, and then. Um, as soon as I was able, I started to work with Tamara around uh, early childhood educators. The thing that really that really um, interests me and concerns me and that I want to contribute to. So that's a long winded story about how we got into early childhood educator well-being. Tamara um, has a she, uh, she worked as a Cert 3 educator in early childhood and her PhD is in early childhood as well. Oh, great. Yeah. So the both of you are, I guess, like the lead researchers of this project. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, yeah. we cooked it up together. <laughs> cooked it up. I love that. <laughs> Stirring it in a big pot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, well, thanks. That's really good. Um, yeah, good, good bit of context there. Um, and yeah, even though you've said that you didn't really have a lot of hands-on experience, it sounds like you've got quite a good idea of what educators do go through and um, how much it really needs to be looked at. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, the next question is what are the, why are the outcomes of this research important for the sector or even, even for broader society to, to see? So our, our project 
I think the important thing is to understand that our project, when we're looking at well-being, when we started looking at educator well-being, there was nothing that sort of nobody really talked about. Well, what is that? Nobody provided any um, conceptual framework. There were some people that were looking at um, educator burnout and they were calling that well-being as if that was everything. But our project, the first thing we, we had to do was really come up with a conceptualization. Well, what is it? And um, so to do that, we our conceptualization is that educator well-being is both if you think about Bromfenbrenner, in the at the center is always the individual and that involves the as the individual their physiological and psychological well-being so it's both of those things um, not just the, the psychological but that happens within the context if you think about Bromfenbrenner again that sort of the next context is where you're operating in so you think about well-being within the context of your work environment now, some of those work environments are really supportive and others not so. And then that service, your early childhood service, operates within a bigger context, the social, cultural, political context. So that's things like regulations, like uh, laws. Um, so general laws about workplaces, but also rules um, related to um, like a CEQA, the, Nas the National Quality Framework, um, and also the culture that you're operating in. So uh, how valued early childhood educators are. So our, our research really focuses on all of those things. And so the importance of the work is that it, it looks not just at the end, saying to the individual educator, well, you just got to look after yourself and stay healthy and fit or, or just to the organisations and say, you know, you've got to provide these resources or to the social cultural political context and says oh we need to value educators more it looks at all of those things at the same time so in i forgot what the question was now alana <laughs> why is it important what are the outcomes of this research <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we 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 all of us who are in the profession know the important role that educators play um, and particularly for me that's particularly for supporting children from the most vulnerable marginalized groups and their families and if we if we want to do that work well we have to have well educators so the the project is is really saying we need well educators for their own sake because we're we're um, having educators that have gone through, you know, two years of a diploma or four years of a degree going on to do a master's and then they're in the field for four or five years and they're completely burnt out. Now, mm. that's not good for the individual. There's all sorts of homework life balances that are that are problematic as well with educators. They work at the weekend, they work late, all those things are going on. Um, so it, Educator wellbeing is, is important for educators themselves. And we know that um, there are high levels of workers' compensation, for example, so which means that educators are really suffering the effects. So it's important for educators to actually understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's important for their organisations because um, staff attrition is costly, staff taking time off sick is costly, workers' compensation is costly. So it's important for organisations as well. It's important for the children and their families because if educators aren't well, they can't do the work properly and um, well or to the best of their ability. And that all of that has cost for us as a society as well. And we're seeing the, the, that now that we're, you know, we're burning out our educators. They're leaving the profession and we don't we don't have anybody to replace them. And um, of course, that leads to rooms closing in, in early learning centres that's going on at the moment. In some extreme cases, centres having to close because they can't get staff. Um, and all of that has long term has the implications for, for the wider society. Mm -hmm. So what we've actually found out is that. And, and probably it wouldn't be any surprise to the educators tuning into this pro project is that, well, we now know that educator wellbeing is compromised. They are getting burnt out. Um, there are high levels of stress. There are high levels of um, imbalance in work-life balance. Um, 
we do have physiological um, problems amongst educators. There, uh, there are stresses and strains that are showing on their bodies around this. Um, and so we've now able, we've now got the evidence to say that. Like probably we've known that for a while, but we've not had the evidence that, that we could mm. use to advocate going forward. So we've now got some evidence around educator well-being being compromised. Um, we've got some evidence around, um, we've done some work that sort of talked to organisations around how they support early childhood educators. And um, that is, that's showing what pre-COVID, um, that showed that actually they weren't really very aware of their responsibilities to educators. They, it wasn't forefront of their mind. I think a lot of that's changed now with COVID, but it wasn't front of their mind. We've done some research during COVID. We did a huge survey um, with we got over 800, nearly 900 participants. So we know that we've got evidence of the psychological impact of uh, COVID and also the financial impact of COVID um, on educators. So we've now got this pretty strong evidence saying that educators well-being is compromised um, mm. that did contribute to the discussions around the the workforce strategy um, wasn't the only thing but it did contribute to that and you will now see the workforce strategy has actually got some things in it about the need going forward to focus on educator well-being we argue that it's not enough and it's not soon enough. Like they've put educator well-being as, as something that needs to be done in the sort of midterm. But we're saying, no, you need to do something about this now. It, it, um, so we've now got evidence that we can advocate and, and argue for um, more attention to educator well-being, more supports for educator well-being, uh, greater systems um, uh, approaches to improving educator well-being um, and the need to, to focus on it much more you know much more quickly than it was mm. wow I feel like you've answered all my questions now Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but but such a then. great yeah, yeah. <laughs> um such a great way to articulate even go, like going all the way back from when you were identifying you know educator well-being actually impacting so many different realms yeah. You know, not just the sector, but families and children and wider society and things like compensation and financial losses. Like it's actually when you do look at the big picture, it really affects yeah. everyone and everything. Yep, and it I absolutely think, does. Uh, we need to get this message out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also thinking, so just, just before we'd started, where you were telling me um, about some of the research that you'd yeah, that, you, that you've done so far. And I guess just to give people some sort of um, practical example of what you've found, maybe you could talk a little bit about the sympathetic parasympathetic regulation yeah, and okay. what you've found there. So um, just as I explained, we, we conceive of early childhood education at wellbeing as being both physiological and psychological. And um, so to do that, we've measured educator wellbeing by, um, we've, we do use surveys, but we've also on 101 educators, we've also um, measured educators wellbeing physiologically. So we've gone into centers and we've measured educators height and weight to get their BMI. We've measured their blood pressure. Um, we've measured their flexibility. And can I tell you, early childhood educators are the most flexible bunch I have. I, really? Like amazing. Yeah, really, really high flexibility. Oh, there you go. <laughs> really good. Um, <laughs> with, uh, we, we ask, um, there's a health survey, so we ask about health issues. But we also use some other techniques. So um, we used to collect salivary cortisol, but we found out that that doesn't work very well. Um, so we're going to move towards a hair cortisol, which is actually very exciting. That's a new project that um, is coming up soon, hopefully. That's just going through ethics at the moment to look at cortisol levels by getting a little bit of hair um, and measuring. If we do that, if we take three centimetres of hair, we can work out how stressed educators have been for the last three months. So that's an exciting project that's coming up. Yes. Very exciting. Yeah, so that, that's never been done before. Um, so that's exciting. But the other thing that we do that's really exciting as well is we get educators to wear um, wearable technology for a day, for a shift. 
-hmm. And that's, um, it, it looks a bit like a rash and inside it's got all these sensors and it measures for the whole shift. It measures the educator's heart rate, their breathing, um, their blood pressure, how far they walk, the force on their body. And um, we've, we're in the process of now starting to do some really technical kind of uh, uh, evaluation of, of, of um, examination of that data. So one of the things that we can do is look at heart rate variability and heart rate variability is over time. And what you can see is when educators are stressed, they have a, a, what's called a sympathetic response, which is when they're, that's the sort of flight, flight or fight. So when you get anxious, so say if, say if a child is climbing and you're a bit anxious, they might fall, so for example, or one child hits another child and your you, anxiety level goes up or a parent comes in and starts complaining well, or anything that sets your heart rate going up. So that's your sympathetic nervous response. And then what we look at is, well, when does the heart rate come back down again? When does the parasympathetic response come in and bring the educator back into equilibrium? And that's called the rest and digest phase. Now, in a healthy human, that should be, okay, you, it's good to have a flight or fight, but it's also good to come back to kind of equilibrium quickly. Um, and what we're, what we're looking at is the relationship between that capacity to come back to equilibrium and the other measures of stress, stressors that educators tell us about from our survey. And what we're finding is that there is a relationship between how the, if educators say they're feeling stressed, so the, the more they say they're feeling, they're reporting stressors like overburdened work, um, not very conducive work environments, all those kind of things, the longer it takes them to come back to equilibrium. So that's, that's really a um, fabulous um, objective research that can show the stress that the educators are under. And when we do that, and then we also use our cortisol, we should come up with some really complex kind of um, patterns that really provide not just subjective measures through surveys but like we can actually show the physiological impacts that it's having in educators yeah wow it's amazing that you have access to that kind of technology yeah we're very lucky we've got a, t um, a colleague up at Griffith University he's um he's actually a paramedic researcher and he used the hexo skins they're called in um researching paramedics response to when the call comes out and how they respond to it and he's oh, very wow. excited to use the 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 um, hexo skins on educators and one of the other things that we're going to be able to do going forward as well is um, look at when educators are interacting with children so we we're going to uh, do videos of, of and, and do observations of educators working with children and we'll be able to look at their parasympathetic response and their interactions with children. And we can, we can look at those two things at the same time. So that's pretty exciting, but that's research in the, that's coming up in the future. We haven't done that yet. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's such a different ball game when you're rushing around trying to make sure everything's getting done and standards being met yeah. and, you know, you're on time with transitions yeah. and toileting and food and blah, blah, blah. It's very different to when you are actually being really present with a child and that's all of a sudden all yeah. those things but how often do we actually get to do that yeah. in the early childhood context like yeah. almost yeah. ever <laughs> it's so our hexaskins tell us how off how much educators are moving as well and educators i think think they move more than they do so it's actually comes up as a sedentary occupation because you're not actually taking a lot of steps every day but when you drill down into that and you think about it, you're probably taking lots of small steps in a small space. And, mm -hmm. you know, you don't really want to be buzzing around, right? If, we, if you're thinking about circular security and all of those kind of aspects about um, being close with children, you don't really want to be buzzing around. You actually do want to be sitting with the children as much mm -hmm. as possible and interacting with them or being close down on their level. So... Mm -hmm. 
it's not a bad thing that educators aren't like walking a lot, but I think educators need to be aware that when they think they've been physically active doing their work, they're probably not, they're probably walking less than they think they are. So that's mm. another um, finding from our research. It's, it helps educators to reflect themselves because we always give results back to educators. So we, we tell them, you know, if they're, their cortisol is at a troubling level on how many steps they took and their blood pressure and those kind of things. And so we give back to the educators so that they can make voices about their individual health. Um, so that's another commitment that we, we make to educators. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's good to be able to feel like it's, it's, your well being's personalized in a sense yeah. and not just being treated as another number and what like you were saying before what one person needs maybe not what another person needs Ex to exactly that is well -being. yeah that's so so important to understand that you know what works for one doesn't necessarily work for another person as well yeah just as we, you were you were speaking then about um you know that the job at times can be seemingly sed sedentary um I'm just having a think about, you know, in my my new job, we have we have circle time, right? And um, that would, you know, I'd love for that to be a time where we can all sit together, 20 children, two educators, peacefully listening to a story or doing songs or whatever it might be. But the reality is that, you know, if we are understaffed or if we're just meeting ratio, yeah. that's, that's not a beautiful picture. And in reality, that's actually really hard. And that's when our cortisol levels go up because, yeah. ratios I just think are they should be much less child to educator ratios so I'm just thinking of all of the things no. educators are doing <laughs> like we said before so many implications you know like hopefully this can really highlight the need for more for better ratios in our profession absolutely I think that my my sense of educators is the hyper vigilance of educators because you're constantly thinking you know how many children have I got? Are we okay? Do we have enough ratios? What's that child doing over there? You're hyper vigilating and you're code switching the whole time. You know, you yep. might be interacting with this child here who might be, you know, six months old and then a, a four month, four year old comes in, you know, and then you switch code to that child. Mm. Then you switch code to another educator who may be, you know, a new graduate. And then you switch code to another educator who might be a Cert 3 who's been working for 50 years in the profession. And then you quit, switch code again because the plumber walks in. You know, yeah. it is really complex work and you're constantly, we've got research in, a, in another project that I'm on showing how educators are switching constantly all the time. And that's exhausting. Oh, really yes. exhausting. Um, it's no wonder you go home at the end of the day feeling exhausted. But just to, I don't want to kind of leave everybody feeling really depressed <laughs> because <laughs> one of the good things is that comes up really consistently in the research, but also in our findings is that educators love their job. Mm. They get oh. reward from their job. And to some extent that balances the not so good things is that the, the good times, the times when you've had, you know, a great interaction with a child or you've seen that child take you know the first time they've smiled or the first time that they've had the confidence to you know stand up and share a story all of those things are what kind of feeds us and keep mm -hmm. and helps us to keep moving forward so educators by and large really like their job they 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 know they're doing a, important work and their feelings of accomplishment are generally very high. So that's a good thing. That's mm, a very good great thing. thing. Yeah. But, you know, we mustn't let, let the fact that educators like their job mean that they don't get paid properly and they don't get looked after. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We can't normalise these, these no. things. Can't, yeah. Um, well, I suppose that's that's kind of the next question, really. So, with all of your, with all the outcomes, the research, the evidence, I suppose, how do you want to move forward with it, and and where do you, where would you like to see this published? Who would you like to know about all these, yeah, all the outcomes of the project? 
Um, so we've, we've published in a few places, mo mostly well, we've published in scholarly journals, we've published in um, professional journals like Every Child, ECA publication, Broadside. So we, we do sign, try and make our research as public as possible. We also have a Facebook page. So everybody, please like our Facebook page. Um, it's literally early child, it's uh, ECEWP yeah. um, Facebook. And anybody who kind of likes the Facebook page, um, we like keep them in contact. We, we, we provide newsletters. We've got a new one coming out in June. So uh, we, we try and make our research as public as possible. We go to conferences and publish. Um, in terms of where we want to go next, we've got we ne we've now got this strong evidence base that early childhood educator wellbeing is important and it's compromised. Um, what we need to do now is make the links between educator wellbeing and um, their, its impact on their interactions with children. So it mm -hmm. makes sense, and we probably, you know, we probably all know intuitively that if we um, are not feeling well, uh, not not on the top of our game, our interactions with children are likely to be compromised. But we don't actually have any evidence for that. So that's where we're going next in terms of um, do it, closing that gap now. We know educator wellbeing is compromised. Now we've got to look at, well, what does that, you know, so what? Mm. You know, it's, yeah, it's bad for educators, but so what? Well, then we say, well, it has impacts on children, on their interactions with children. So that's where we're going next. And to, to do that work where um, we're um, trialling the hair cortisol. So there'll be um, a project looking at whether or not educators will actually give us a little bit of their hair um we need to know whether and that, that's going to work and um we're also doing a pilot that um so that we can um, measure children's interactions so that that's another project that's coming up um and importantly at the same time it's it, you know it's all well and good us keep saying well educator well-being is compromised but you know so what how what can we do to like improve educators well-being and unfortunately there isn't any evidence about what works um, it's still such a new area that we don't have evidence um, there's a little bit of evidence that mindfulness works now I'm not saying it doesn't work I'm just saying we don't have a lot of evidence for what works. We've just mm -hmm. done a project that has looked at the impact of a professional supervision on educators. Now, professional supervision is something that doesn't happen typically in early childhood. It's, it's absolutely common in other fields. In social work, it's actually, a, um, it's a, you have to have clinical or professional supervision to do your job. And it, what it is, is an opportunity to kind of debrief about the impact that the work is having on you. So vicarious trauma, if you, for example, if you, you know, you might have a child that's been removed from their parents' care in your centre, that causes trauma to educators. What do they do with that? So mm. being able to, um, to talk about those issues through something like clinical supervision, um, but also just the everyday things like how do you, how do you work with your colleagues? How do you provide um, support for children and families? So clinical or professional supervision is what enables that to happen. And what we know from this evaluation that we did is that it does work. Um, it, it contributes to educators' well-being. It contributes to them being able to work more effectively with teams. It contributes to educators feeling um, valued. So it, it does, it ticks all the boxes. It's, it, it is um is it, it's an important um kind of tool that's called an important resource for educators mm -hmm. it's not widely available many like there's very few organizations in fact i only know of two that provide professional clinical or, um, supervision for their educators but i do know that some standalone services have providing it as professional development for their educators um, you can access clinical supervision through um, employee assistance programs. The problem with that is that those programs, the people that you go to, the counsellors that you go to, don't know about early childhood education. And so you have to tell them all about early childhood education because we know that when 
the supervision works it works when the supervisor the person yeah. actually knows about the field um Has been, yeah. yeah and they they understand the pressures um mm. so yeah so that's the where we're going as well then is trying to um gather more evidence around what works so if you guys are listening tonight have got this amazing program that you found or that things that you've designed in your center that you know really contribute to the well-being of the educators in your service we'd love to hear about it um, what we're trying to do is gather we've got some templates and we're trying to gather um, all of that information so that we can share it because mm. we're aware that you know it'll be a while before we get to the stage where we can do more evaluations um, mm. but if we can gather stories from the field and we can share those stories then we can you know ho hopefully people will be able to access support um, for their well-being of course there are all that you know the the sort of standard supports like um bu like um uh, mental health programs or that you know even going to see a gp there are all of those kind of resources that are available to you but um the more sort of targeted supports for early childhood educators we really don't know what works um yeah and which we're, we're just trying to gather some of that information yeah yeah and it's so holistic like you said gosh what yeah. what someone might need professionally like you know that clinical supervision yeah. might be different to what someone needs personally like yeah the whole range of things it's really like we all kind of need our own supervisor in yeah. a way yeah. um, we've all been through so many different things in our lives that make us who we are so i suppose I um that that's what a, yeah that's what a good clinical professional supervisor will do they will help you become aware of what it is in your situation that's the issue and it may be for some educators you know simple things like having furniture that's the right size like we mm -hmm. it's it's meant you're meant to have furniture that's the right size in your service but in our study we know that very few services have um the right size furniture or have private bathrooms or you know mm -hmm. have somewhere to put your handbag so you don't have to be worrying about it all day um it, it, all of, yeah basic human rights right <laughs> like, is, yeah, yeah. Oh, sometimes i've had team meetings on child size chairs before yeah yeah and it Not okay. you know and educators say, oh, it doesn't matter, but it does. You know, you do that for a long time, even though you're really flexible. <laughs> you yeah. continue to do that. It, it, it does matter. And particularly we do have, a, um, uh, you know, a problem with obesity in early childhood, just like in the, the wider community. So, you know, sit, larger people sitting on small chairs, accidents happen and they do happen. We've got evidence that they have. That yeah, yeah. Wow. I think not only that, Sandy, but it's just also the... Um, you know that that sense of integrity that you have as a teacher you know like i should be sitting on a chair for the size of i'm i'm the teacher i'm not the child trying yeah. to fit into their <laughs> you know like and yeah. i think it also it helps the children to see you as the the person with authority and i'm not saying that in a way where they should be feeling fearful or anything but just integrity is the word that comes to mind i guess and dignity and i think dignity know. is the important thing because what what typically educators say is things like oh i don't mind or no it's okay and because mm -hmm. they think that their well-being has to be pitted against children so you know it an aspect of well-being is to have a safe workplace but that doesn't come at the cost of children that that's your right as an educator to have that you know and children also need to see that educators have rights just like other like their their peers do so it's not a it's not a it's not a you know is it about educator well-being or is it about the children it's about both because mm -hmm. support the educators and they would they will provide better high quality care for the children and we know that <laughs> so yes. it all makes perfect sense yeah and there are other things that like you know when you said about um individualized that you know you've got to think about the organizational context that you're working in as well so we've got evidence that and I, I find this incredibly troubling around the level of bullying that goes on in early childhood mm -hmm. educators against educators but also families against educators so we've got a problem there as well 
this should not happen in early childhood education. We should not be bullying one another. We, sh we you know, we're anti-bullying against children, but we shouldn't be doing it to one another. But we've got high levels of bullying that need to be addressed. So we're, we're highlighting all these by taking that holistic approach that I, I said we started with, we're highlighting all of these sort of things that need to be thought about and mm. where attention needs to be paid. Now, in one organisation, maybe no problem with bullying whatsoever. But in another organisation, that, that's the issue. And that is leading to high levels of stress. So mm. that kind of self-reflective, trying to understand what's going on in your service um, and you know, standing up for your own right to a healthy workplace. Children's services are places for children, but that doesn't mean they're not adult work environments as well. You know, you've got to think about them as being safe, secure. And when I say safe and secure, I don't mean just physio physically, I mean emotionally safe places as well, where, you know, when you're feeling, when you know that, you know, you've, you've had you know, a terrible morning, the children have kind of gotten on your nerves, you should be able to say, I need to step out. You should feel safe enough to say that. Yeah. Now, that, that means that the educator that stands up and says that has to feel safe and secure. It means that the person that says, okay, off you go, acknowledges that and recognises that and then doesn't go, oh, she's always slipping out for 10 minutes, you know. So it's, mm. it's everybody recognising that this is a right that we all have to a safe, secure environment that we can all thrive. Not, you know, everybody can thrive. Um, and then we're not chewing up and burning out our educators, which is what's happening at the moment. Mm. Oh, such good points. Such good points. And I think, um, you know, we, we need to start working together, don't we? It's, it's really easy to not get along in a workforce of like what 94 percent women is that yeah. right <laughs> it's a yeah. lot of women <laughs> we don't yes. always get along we're not all friends <laughs> um yeah. but we need to start being on each other's team yeah I'm you don't have to be you don't have to be friends right you, but you've got to be a good colleague and being a good colleague is respecting one another it's um acknowledging when somebody else is not feeling too great because then you know that they'll do the same back for you. You know, it's reciprocal, yes. it, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, I, I do find that incredibly troubling that um, the amount of bullying that we've identified. We've got a paper coming out on that soon as well. Okay. Will that be in the newsletter? <laughs> uh, the, the, the paper will be a journal article and we will report on the finding in newsletter in a few issues time because we have to wait for the pub for the publication to come out so we will tell you about it um the findings but it'll be in a little while yeah great yeah. i think it's really good that everyone stays up to date with your project you know obviously because there's just a myriad of things that can evolve yeah. from this yeah. and you know all of these little bits that you've said tonight hopefully educators that are listening or directors or whoever can you know if they're having a team meeting or something soon, yeah. these little bite-sized pieces of information can yeah. really um, inform how they talk to their yeah. team and what needs to be identified in terms of, yeah, how is our well-being impacting this, that and the other. And there are some um, good resources from ECA around that as well. So starting to, you know, it used to be that whenever any, any, anything in early childhood was talking about well-being, it was always talking about the children, but we're now seeing some yeah. resources that are focusing on the educators. But there's nothing yep. to stop a service from making educator well-being a focus of a of a um, a staff meeting, for example, and mm. thinking about well, what could we do? What could what are we doing really well? What could we do better? Mm. Now, the challenge with doing that, of course, is that some people in that context are a bit disempowered. People aren't necessarily going to put their hand up and say what the issue is, particularly if there's something like bullying going on. So sometimes yeah. you actually need external people to come and help facilitate that kind of work. Um, and the other thing you've got to be careful when you're talking about well-being is that it brings up things for people. It triggers things for people. And and I should have said at the beginning of this, actually, that if this, you know, when we talk about well-being, um, it can it can 
heighten um or bring back memories of issues that you had in your own childhood and trigger things and so you need to kind of be aware of that and know where to go for support and as i said there are lots of places beyond blue and so on who can help you with that so it's a tricky thing to for centers to take on um because of those issues but it is also in a really critical thing to take on and to think about um yeah so yeah <laughs> Wow, some really, really good things to consider, think about, discuss, move forward with. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy, for, yeah, just this huge insight into, you know, it's, it's even, I mean, a lot of things we've discussed are things I've already identified and what I've, I guess, tried to, what's informed the work that I do in giving seminars and workshops but there's actually so much more to it and I'm so glad I spoke to you about it and that yeah whoever's watching can just gain a lot more perspective on or maybe even just feel a little bit more validated for how they feel you know a lot of what you're saying is truth and even for me I go oh yes I'm glad that you've said that like oh yeah I felt that too um yeah. so it's it's really important um yeah is there anything else that you feel would be um I mean, obviously everyone can follow you on the Facebook page and sign up to your newsletter, but is there anything else you'd sort of like to end our discussion with in regards to the project? Um, I, I'll just kind of come back to the beginning really, which is that Tamara and I started the project and, and now we've got a team of people working with us from uh, across a number of universities. But we always st we started the project with a genuine concern for educators and a genuine recognition and understanding of the complexity of the work how challenging it is but also how rewarding it is so i just want to thank educators for the work that they do um, and we, we really do um, respect and value your work and we hope that our contribution our research can can sort of help in a little way um, maybe not immediately with supporting educators today but at, at least sort of telling a bit of a story so that we can keep moving towards um, getting better support better conditions you talked about ratios I you know I think ratios is who who made up those numbers like who said yeah, one like educator <laughs> like there is no evidence behind that right so I would like to see ratios that are different I would like to see um, better supports for educators and of course higher wages and better conditions so we're doing our bit um, and we'd you know like to take people along on that journey maybe we're now um, with sending out um, invites to participate please join up <laughs> um, because we need participants always when when we're doing these projects so you know we're, we're on your side and uh, we're looking forward to continuing the journey to understanding more about educator wellbeing and hopefully how we can all work together to improve it. Yeah. Are we a cheerleader, Sandy? <laughs> Along the way, I love love receiving all the updates and um, things like that. So, all the best um, moving forward with the project. I hope that this Thank gets you. a lot. This this session has got um, gets you a lot more exposure because um, it's just wonderful what you're doing. And as an educator, um, on behalf of everyone else who's an educator, thank you so much for, for what you're doing. It's, it's great for us. Thank you. And doing something as simple as liking our Facebook page actually contributes to what we, what in research world is called impact, because it, it shows that it's of interest to people. And then when we go to write grant applications to get funding to do our research we can say oh we've got we, we've now got 90 1900 followers or something but the more followers we have so get everybody that you know to like us yes. and <laughs> we're able then to say what well, you know guess what we've got this many followers that it's obviously something that's important so even something as simple as liking our facebook page you're contributing to um to the research really a hundred percent. No, I'm with that all the way. I'll tag you in this if I can, um, and I'll just share it on my page Thank when you. I can as well. <laughs> yeah. And good Thank luck with so all you're doing, Alana. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's um yeah, I mean a lot of what I've what I've read, a lot of your work has informed that as well. I, I often mention it in workshops. And um, but now even more exposure. Hopefully, I think I've got over a thousand followers as well. So hopefully, um, this is yeah, just just branching out and getting everyone's attention because it it really needs to to be out there. Such important work. Right. Thank you so much again for your time, Sandy. Um, oh, nice. Look forward to staying in touch with you and the project. And um, yeah, have a lovely evening. Thank okay, you so too. much. Thanks very much for the time. Okay. Bye now. Bye, Sandy.